Hey guys, what's going on? This is John from Friends of Your Benefits. It's that time of year again, and you know what that means. It's time to set your New Year's resolution, and unfortunately, it also means that your healthcare deductible is also going to reset. Your New Year's resolution, like so many other things out there, could involve finding the best version of yourself as it relates to taking care of your mind and your body. And for some people out there, that includes joining a gym, trying the latest fad diet out there, and perhaps something more simple, such as tracking your steps. But if you're going to be successful in hitting your goals, you really need to be pain-free. And unfortunately, a lot of people out there are suffering from these things called varicose veins. They're very painful. And today, in order to learn more about varicose veins and what your options are out there, we have Dr. Gary Knackman from NJ Bain Care. Hey, Dr. Gary, how's it going? Welcome to the show. Thanks, John. Just call me Gary. Fair enough. <laughs> so, Gary, if you don't mind, I want our audience to get to know you a little bit better. So why don't you tell our audience a little bit about your background and your favorite thing, practicing medicine? Well, thanks, John. Uh, my name is Dr. Gary Knackman. Um, I graduated uh, medical school a few years ago in 1988. And I trained as a general surgeon and then a fellowship in uh, vascular surgery. So I'm board certified in vascular surgery. Initially, uh, after my fellowship, uh, I took a job at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School where I was director of vascular surgery research. Pretty busy. I had a clinical practice. I was doing research. I was teaching. And then in 2009, I wanted to simplify my life a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I created a private practice by the name of NJ Vein Care in Clifton, New Jersey. And it focuses on patients uh, with venous disease and who also have some cosmetic uh, concerns as well. So very cool, uh, Dr. Gary. And actually, I'll call you Gary, as you mentioned before. So, Gary, you know, it definitely seems like you're a specialist out there and you focus on varicose veins. So, why don't you tell our audience actually what varicose veins are? We have three types of veins in our leg. Uh, mm -hmm. Deep veins by the muscle, superficial veins under the skin, some you can see, some you can't see, and then connecting veins called perforator veins. Varicose veins are superficial veins that you can see uh, bulging through the skin mm -hmm. uh, that are you know, bigger than three millimeters in diameter. Uh, and they're not just a cosmetic concern. Sometimes it means that there's an underlying problem hmm. with the one-way vein valves that we have in our superficial deep or perforator system. So how do you actually know if you have varicose veins, right? So I've heard people say, oh, they're painful, they're cosmetic. How do you distinguish between what is cosmetic and what is actually something that's inducing pain? The cosmetic veins that most people see in their leg uh, are the one millimeter diameter little red thread veins or maybe two or three millimeter diameter little purplish uh, reticular veins. The varicose veins are the bigger bulging uh, three millimeter veins or, or larger. But just because uh, they may have cosmetic veins, uh, the spider veins, doesn't mean that they don't have an underlying medical issue that's causing those to form. So let's say you have varicose veins, right? So what are your treatment options, you know, I'm asking? Like, is this something you just have to deal with? You take medication? Someone walks in your practice. What do you say to them? Well, the most important thing is taking a thorough history and physical exam. You want to find out, first of all, if they have any family history of varicose veins, uh, because they do run in families. Hmm. And then also the type of symptoms they might be having. And frequently, they're very subtle. It could just be as simple as a dull ache at the end of the day in their legs, restless legs, jumpy legs, hmm. cramping sometimes as well. Some people come in with you know a, a complaint that the veins are actually tender to the touch. Uh, and that really implies that there might be some inflammatory condition of the vein or even a superficial blood clot. Is this something that you're born with or is it something that develops uh, sometimes over time? That's an excellent question, John. When I was a surgical resident uh, at St. Luke's Roosevelt in New York City, I was a co-author in a landmark paper that was looking at the etiology of varicose veins. Hmm. Since then, there's been a lot of research, uh, and it's probably a genetic disorder. Uh, it's very rare for a baby to be born with varicose veins, but okay. it, it actually can happen. But that's probably a different process. Most people, though, are born with a propensity for those vein valves to fail over time. Hmm. There's too much pressure in the veins, and the veins dilate, and they cause kind of a poor venous return out of your leg and blood pooling mm -hmm. and some swelling of the leg that delay at the end of the day. 
uh, and even some discoloration of the skin. And ultimately, some people actually develop ulcers of the skin. Wow. Let's, uh, is varicose veins, let's uh, say this another way, right? You have varicose veins. Is it something that like, what happens if it's left untreated? If someone doesn't have their veins treated, they're at an increased risk for developing a superficial blood clot. And sometimes those superficial blood clots can migrate into your deep veins, uh, known as a DVT, deep vein thrombosis. And those are very serious because they can lead to a clot breaking off and going to your lung, causing what we know as a, a pulmonary embolus. Well, that doesn't sound pleasant at all. It's not, and that can be life-threatening. So varicose veins are not just a cosmetic concern. So once we take a, a thorough history and physical exam, really the, uh, the mainstay for making a good diagnosis uh, is a venous ultrasound. It's very important that it's done with the patient uh, standing up hmm. or inclined uh, very steeply on a bed. And what we're actually measuring is the amount of time it takes your vein valves to open and close. And there's certain parameters for you know, what's normal and what's abnormal. And when the valves don't close fast enough, we call that chronic venous insufficiency due to valvular reflux. Hmm. So let's say someone's in there, and I assume that surgery is probably the primary option for someone who is looking to get rid of varicose veins, right? Is that something they go to the hospital for? Can it be done, let's say, in a doctor's office? How does that typically go? We start with a trial of something called a venous compression sock. It's a medical-grade sock. Hmm. Uh, that the insurance companies uh, require patients to wear typically for three months. Uh, it can actually improve the way people's legs feel, but it really doesn't address the root cause of the problem, which is the failed veins. Uh, most physicians actually think that the stocking requirement is just a little silly, to be honest. If really? You're, <laughs> you know, if you're in a little rowboat that's sinking, yeah. <laughs> you don't just bail. You find the leak and you would plug it. Sure. <laughs> um, and it's a big problem, but it's a hoop that the insurance companies create that we have to jump through. Now, uh, occasionally there are some people who have very mild symptoms and they wear the socks and, and they're fine, particularly maybe some elderly people. And that's okay. Uh, but the overwhelming majority of patients and the, the thousands of patients I've taken care of, mm -hmm. uh, very few actually are happy just to wear the compression socks. And so once they've worn the compression socks, you know, we create a tailored treatment plan based on the anatomy of where the vein valves are bad. Mm -hmm. uh, most patients have a problem with a vein called the great saphenous vein okay. that runs from the groin down the inside of the knee towards the ankle. And the, and the part of the vein that's most critical is the part kind of from the groin to the knee. Historically, um, we used to do a procedure where we would surgically strip that vein, and it typically mm -hmm. was done in a hospital under either general or spinal anesthesia. We would make an incision by the ankle, an incision in the groin, and basically separate the vein, the great saphenous vein, from the deep vein in the groin, and we would pass kind of a flexible plastic hanger kind of material. Hmm. It was almost like 100 test fishing line yeah. <laughs> from the ankle all the way up to the groin, tie it uh, to the vein in the groin and literally pull it out of the leg down towards the ankle. It was a, it was a gross procedure, but it Better worked. Better than me. <laughs> yeah, but it worked and it's all sure. that we had uh, to do. But uh, maybe about 15 years ago, the idea was developed that we, rather than stripping the vein, we could leave it in place, but just close it. And that was accomplished with something called a thermal ablation technique, mm -hmm. heat. Yeah. Uh, and it's very commonly performed uh, using uh, something called radio frequency energy. It's electricity uh, being delivered through a very specialized catheter that cauterizes the vein, or an alternatively, you could use a laser fiber uh, to heat the vein up. And these are office procedures. Uh, they typically just take an hour. You're in and out of the hmm. office in an hour, done under local anesthesia. There's no need to go to a hospital or even a surgical center to do this. And by closing the vein, you now have, uh, where the valves were bad, you now mm -hmm. have the blood rerouting itself instantaneously into the deeper veins, who in 90% of our patients are normal. There are many patients who that procedure is sufficient, even if they have bulging varicose veins. Over time, those veins you know, will shrink. But some people have very large veins that are still painful. Sure. And that really gives a couple different options, either surgically removing them, again, under local anesthesia, 
sometimes in the office or at a surgical center, not with big incisions. We can do it basically through little needle punctures in the leg. We can go in with like a little micro hook and pull the veins out. Or we can do vein injections. Um, there's another technique. Uh, rather than doing a thermal ablation uh, of the saphenous vein, something called verathena, which okay. is a newer treatment where we do an injection of its foam sclerotherapy. It's an FDA-approved drug hmm. uh, used to close the vein. It can be used both for varicose veins and the refluxing great or even the small saphenous vein that runs kind of behind the knee down towards the ankle. There are some other uh, techniques that are used. Uh, essentially, you can close the vein with something like crazy glue. Um, it's certainly, <laughs> I hope you're not using crazy it's glue. It's certainly not crazy glue, <laughs> but it's in that family. And those type of glues have been used in surgery for many years. It's FDA approved. Uh, most insurance carriers aren't currently covering it, but it does you know, provide you know, another option. So one thing I want to uh, touch on, right? So sounds like there's a lot of options out there for people. There's not just one size fit all. You kind of customize a treatment plan that best fits the needs for the particular patient. What's the recovery like, right? So let's say I go to your office tomorrow. I get the treatment. Am I driving myself home? Let's start there. If we're going to close your vein uh, with Verathena, mm -hmm. you could absolutely drive uh, yourself home. Uh, even the benefit procedure or the venous closure with the radiofrequency ablation, you could drive yourself home. Sometimes, though, we do give patients a uh, prescription for some Valium. Okay. And in that situation, we kind of prefer people don't drive a Valium. So they would have someone drive them home. Fair enough. So once they get home, right, how long is the recovery like before the person's able to resume their normal life? Or we mentioned before, let's say they're starting some New Year's resolution that involves finding the healthiest version of themselves and they really want to be gung-ho and start exercising. How long before they can start exercising, give or take? Well, the most important thing is that uh, for people to understand is you're not on bed rest you know, okay. when you have these procedures. We want you up and walking around because that helps hmm. prevent blood clots. Um, and in terms of you know return to work, Mm -hmm. Initially, that's an important concern that patients have. Sure. And it really depends on what kind of a job you have. If uh, I do the procedure, let's say, on a Friday, mm -hmm. most people can return to work on Monday. If they're, let's say, uh, in law enforcement or do construction and they're climbing ladders and things, maybe they need a few more days off. But there's really minimal downtime with these procedures. Okay. In terms of exercise, we do recommend two weeks without doing any vigorous a cardiovascular exercise. Mostly, we don't want the blood flow in the leg to increase dramatically, okay. uh, where it might force the vein back open. But these procedures are, you know, very successful. Um, Ninety plus percent of the time, these veins are going to stay closed long term. So, one thing you touched upon earlier that I kind of want to circle back to, and obviously, our channel is friends with your benefits, and we really focus on helping people make better benefits decisions. So, you mentioned before the sock, right? Let's say someone goes through the SOC requirement. The procedures that you've described, are they typically covered by health insurance? And how do you actually know if your plan will cover it? Any recommendations? Certainly. The, uh, the treatment of uh, chronic venous insufficiency due to the valve problems is absolutely covered by just about every benefit plan. Um, as long as uh, patients meet uh, certain requirements, in the field, it's known as medical necessity. Sure. And it's that they have significant symptoms, that they've tried to wear the compression socks, and that the anatomy of where the valves are abnormal meets certain criteria. What about Medicare? Uh, Medicare absolutely covers venous treatments such that we've discussed and also the Medicaid plans as well. For people out there who are watching, maybe they are suffering varicose veins. If you want them to take one thing away from today, what do you want them to know? It's important to know that the this is a situation where the treatment is not worse than the disease. Okay. There, there's a lot of misconceptions uh, in older people, particularly, uh, mm -hmm. that these procedures are very invasive. They cause tremendous pain and there are lots of complications because some of the older procedures that we did, you know, uh, you weren't too happy for a good six weeks after sure. vein stripping. Very different today. I've personally had the procedure done uh, on my right leg about nine years ago. I okay. had uh, the benefit, the radiofrequency ablation procedure. Within three days, I was back at work in my practice. Incredible. Wow. 
Gary, let's say there's someone out there and they want to learn a little bit more about varicose veins beyond our video, or perhaps they have a question for you and they want to reach out to you directly. Where can they go to reach you and perhaps find additional information about your practice? Certainly. Uh, the best way to reach me is uh, either calling my office, 973-778-2222, or go to our website, uh, njvaincare.com, or you can send me an email at info at njvaincare.com. Well, Dr. Gary, thank you very much for coming on the show today. And for our viewers out there, we're actually going to have Dr. Gary Knackman back. Stay tuned. And for those of you out there, we want to hear from you guys. Is varicose vein treatment something that you'd consider in the future? And if so, what do you imagine that your treatment plan would look like? We encourage you, as always, to subscribe, comment below. And if you're on LinkedIn, feel free to follow me. I'm John Coleman. Thank you for joining.